Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I, <coughs> um, I don't know if we, it's within my gift to make decisions about dress code, but um, please feel free if you want to take jackets and ties uh, off. I've made a bit of a unilateral decision and it looks like it's been supported. So. Um, on that note, obviously, it is incredibly uh, hot. Um, all the doors are, uh, will be left open if anyone needs to go outside or get cool off or get water, then please uh, feel free to do so. Um, welcome to the Safeguarding Overview and Scrutiny Committee uh, today, 19th of July, um, and we'll go s uh, straight into uh, the agenda. Um, apologies then, please. Yes, Chair, so we have apologies this morning from Mrs. Burnett, Mrs. Eagland, Mr. Huckfield, and Mrs. Perry. Thank you. Um, I think I had uh, assurance that other people would be here, but I'm pretty sure they come on the train, so it may well be that, 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 that that's what's delaying them. Uh, any declarations of interest? No. Item three, then, minutes of uh, the meeting held on the 16th of June. I assume everyone's had uh, an opportunity to uh, look at them. Are you happy that I sign them as a true and accurate record? And um, straight into item uh, four then, draft early help uh, strategy. Uh, Mark, did you want to say a few words? Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good morning, good morning, every, every, everyone. Um, so um, early, uh, early, early, early help. It's the, um, it's the stuff that we do with partners and what everybody does before children sort of prep into being officially recognised as children in need or in need of some sort of child protection uh, in, 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 in intervention. intervention. Uh, and, it's, and it's part of the Working Together Safeguarding Children's um, Act uh, document, um, which makes it clear that early help means providing support as soon as a problem emerges at any point in a child's life from the foundation years through to the teenage years. But what we... What we want to try and make this strategy to be is about how we can, uh, and that's a whole partners, support families to um, do a lot of this sort of work them, them, them themselves, you know, and not and not and not and not be there doing it for people, but to help them to get or stay on the straight straight and narrow. So the outcomes within that st uh, strategy are achieved. So what we're looking for this morning, Mr Chairman, if that's okay, is comments and thoughts about the strategy. Um, it's by no means a finished do 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 document, uh, and N N Natasha will uh, happily take you through the bits. There's quite a lot of it um, since it's first been, that first draft has been done, that we're going to take out and rearrange, and Natasha will go through that. It's a bit too long at this moment, too, too, too wordy, and... Um, doesn't highlight some of the, um, the, the positive things that are already happening before partners uh, at any level have to get involved. And that's just as much important in, in sort of early help as it is by intervention by, the, uh, by, uh, by ourselves and other partners. So if I may, if I can hand over to Natasha, who will take us through it. Uh, yeah, please do. Morning, everybody. So um, just a few words then before I pass over then for comments. So um, we want Staffordshire's children to be happy, to be healthy, to achieve and to contribute to their communities and feel safe and belong. And her early help is a critical part of achieving this. Quite often, families will tell us that actually they need that help and support in a timely way. We've had an early help strategy for some time, and whilst a lot has been achieved, there is evidence that some families um, are benefiting from this. Actually, a sharper focus is now needed as we emerge from the pandemic to address some of the inequalities that families are telling us that they are experiencing. Children and families are engaged and have told us about a lot about the positives that they experience once they benefit from that early help and support. But sometimes they tell us that they did not get this early help early enough and therefore their needs or problems escalated. Sometimes they feel it is hard to know who to turn to as there is wealth of information out there but sometimes it's not clear how they get the help and support they need. We need to understand how the system works um, and feel that that is difficult to do from the outside. Sometimes people feel tr like they are treated differently when they ask for early help and support. The case for early help is clear, but the reasons we need um, this now have been brought into sharp focus after the pandemic. 
what we've seen is lots of agencies taking a single agency approach to try and address that early help and often that undoubtedly leaves gaps in service provision um, for children and families. We know that there are more children now struggling financially as a result of the pandemic and most of those households who will be struggling will actually be working households. So actually the need for the partnership to start to um, think differently about those who might need that early help and support is critical. The pandemic we have seen has exacerbated inequalities impacting on both finances, mental health and wellbeing and physical health. And these impacts are being felt more now by families than ever before. What we know is that half of serious case reviews relate to families who are just below the threshold of support. And so as Mark says, the need for us to think about how we identify those families who benefit from support before they are known to statutory services is really important. A few points to note as Mark kind of alluded to before. Um, the strategy has been prepared by a range of stakeholder partners. Um, it's a draft and so it very much is up for comment. We anticipate that the, um, the length of the document will be significantly shorter than it currently is, um, as we do feel there is currently some repetition within the document. There also needs to be a sharper focus on um, that help that, that we see within families before they need that statutory early help or what we call an early help assessment. And so again, some of the examples that are in the strategy we expect to change to reflect this. What the strategy does cover though is the definition of what early help is, who is most likely to need it and what we want the partnership to achieve. And we hope that that provides a clear outline of our ambitions to make sure that we can continue to um, achieve the outcomes that we've identified. So I shall pass over to members for any thoughts, feedback, comment or reflection. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Just a couple of, uh, from me. Right at the very beginning, you were, I, I, I think, Mark, you were talking about how this is uh, about working together. Um, all of this obviously uh, hangs or fails on whether those organisations work together. Um, how, how confident are we that we have a system in place where all of the relevant agencies are currently working together to deliver this? So um, I think what's become clear is that during COVID, a lot of agencies went into their single agency response and looked inwards as part of that response. I think it was unprecedented and for a lot of people they were just looking at, are we okay and actually are we able to deliver the services and support that we need to? And quite often, I think some of those connections between partner agencies was adversely affected as a result of that. However, when we came out of the pandemic, we had a, a really kind of good discussion really as a partnership and at the Family Strategic Partnership Board, we shared with them the aspiration of central government to um, kind of take forward the family hub model. And part of that model is around a single point of access. So it, it basically makes it really clear that actually for families, they don't need to understand how the system works. They just need to know where to go to get the help and support they need. And actually the partner should be working much more effectively around the needs of the families to try and make sure they get to the right places. And, um, and I anticipated that when we had that conversation, it might be quite a difficult conversation because essentially we're asking everybody to kind of change the way in which they work to better meet the needs of families. And, and you know, they've all got the systems and processes that were in place, but actually the partners were really on board with doing that. And I think they recognise the current system challenges we face. So I think partners are absolutely in the space of wanting to work more holistically in the need to meet the needs of families. I just don't think we're there yet. Um, I think there's lots of good, good examples of practice and, you know, families have given us some lovely feedback about the support that they get once they, they get it. And I think partners are very active in team around the family meetings, but I think there's more we could do at that earliest stage to make sure that they don't have to understand and navigate that system of support. Thank you. Councillor Pardesha. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, page 15 of the report, one figure I found particularly worrying was that more than 26, it says, of reception aid children haven't reached the expected levels of um, development across our early years. And we're all aware that um, at that stage, the longer a, a child is, is left, the more likely they are to never reach their, their potential or the stage that they that they should be. And obviously that's going to have a, a knock-on effect later on in life as far as their economic well-being and everything is concerned. Um, that is what levelling up means to me. 
but how realistic is it where we are that when we have children like that come into school that they can have access to that help and support really quickly and part of the reason why I asked that is that the um, the report, the complaints report we're going to be looking at later, I do believe says that um, the complaints are up about 50% from parents and carers who are saying they're having to wait too long for help for their child. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Perhaps I can start on that and perhaps then uh, Natasha might be able to fill in some of the, the gaps. Um, one in four children not being school ready, uh, in effect, with the right level of development, is clearly not as good as it should be. Um, but if we go back six, seven years, that was 50%. Uh, clearly, that really, really wasn't good enough. Um, so through lot, so through working with with um, nurseries and other providers and lots of other things that we've uh, they've been been doing. Um, that moved from 50% to 75% who'd achieved a good level of development. There's still a way to go. The slightly unfortunate thing about it was that uh, last year or the year before would have been the, the first uh, tranche of those, those young people, children, who had got to their SATs at the end of year six. So we would have been able to see whether actually, uh, from an academic perspective, that um, having re reached a good level of development had had an impact, but obviously there was no SATs before, for, 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 for absolute obvious reasons. Um, when you compare us nationally with those figures, we are very much in the top quartile of performance around, around the country. And in some areas, when it's split down, we are you know, in right, 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 right up there. More stuff to do around, around that, uh, abs abs absolutely, but heading in the right direction completely. Thank you. Um, I suppose the other things to say about um, early years is we absolutely um, know and understand, and ag again, Mark's been a huge advocate really of, of the importance of early years and trying to get in earlier. We know that children who don't get a good level of development struggle to catch up. Um, throughout their school career and um, I know we've um, had a, a lot of conversations really about how we can help and support. There's a number of interventions and in work like Mark said that we've been putting in place to try and seek to address that and like Mark says it's definitely had an impact. There's still more we could do and I think the, again um, COVID has, has kind of exacerbated some of those inequalities because what you would have seen perhaps is um, some of those families who were able to help and support while the children were at home um, actually have, have come back to school kind of ready to learn and for some of those children, they won't have. So there's definitely, like I say, more we need to do. Um, I think we're in a really strong position though in Staffordshire. I think we've got a, a really good network of children centres which are, are starting to think about how they become um, family hubs. Um, and actually, a lot, of the, a lot of the families that do need that help and support do know where to go to to get some of that. And we do do a lot of targeted outreach, which again, is, is un, un, unsimilar to kind of a lot of local authorities. So I think there is, there's a recognition that there's more we need to do, but again, I do think there is some really good examples of really good practice in the early years that we need to build up and out from. Councillor Sutton. And, and if I just add, add a little bit, and of course it's, you know, certainly with um, young, young, younger children, pre preschool children, um, it's not always about what all the partners and everybody can do. It's about us encouraging parents and carers to be able to do and offer that, sp that, that support. And from a development perspective, the way development is, is, is measured, uh, and, uh, and you know, speaking of a parent of a, uh, of a, of a head teacher who will, who will stay, you know, it's, it's about children being able to come and sit in the classroom at that reception and be sort of uh, able to concentrate for, 20, for, for, for 20, 20 minutes, understand how to behave around, amongst other children. And clearly, um, what's happened during the pandemic with children not being socialising and being in those sort of uh, arenas certainly doesn't help when it comes to 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 that sort of aspect of how they have to have to have to behave you know um you know with 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 with, with their peers the um the, pro the hungry little minds program that we have um where new parents are able to uh, sign up for a series of emails that that comes through that gives simple and basic advice covers things you know like you know uh, the importance of reading 
reading, to, reading to your children, sitting down with them, spending quality, t quality, quality, quality time with them um, around that, and that all helps with development, which all helps with them being uh, ready to learn when they first start in reception or otherwise. Thank you for that. Uh, we've spoken previously um, about things like low-level neglect and we have young people and, and discussed that difficulty that we sometimes have in um, how do you distinguish between sort of bad or poor parenting and, and actual uh, neglect and we've had some unfortunate history around some of those things here. Uh, and the strategy seems fine um, around trying to identify young people who might need that help. But um, I think you also talked about uh, a broader understanding of people and trying to encourage people to um, do things for themselves. How, how, how does that build into this strategy? It, it appears to me that it works if we can identify an individual. How, how do we that, have that more holistic view that says, uh, how are we helping parents to do these things if they haven't come forward or if we haven't identified them? Is there a, a, a general policy? Um, so again, we're quite lucky in, in Staffordshire. We have, um, we have a database um, which we use that's basically made up of a range of different indicators. There's probably about 70 different indicators that we use. Um, those indicators come from a range of different partners across police, local authority, um, some from external providers that we commission, for example, and um, you can see that built up at a family level. So, um, for example, I'd be able to see both myself, my husband, and my two children. And it would be able to um, be used to build a composition, really, an understanding of what's going on in that family. So it'll tell you things like um, any police call-outs for domestic abuse, um, any non-attendance, perhaps at some of the appointments that you might have had with your GP. So actually, that, that system allows us to identify um, children who might benefit from our help and support and it was something that we used quite successfully during covid so we identified children who'd been um who might have been known for a number of indicators so i think it was above five at the time um, and we targeted them for a proactive visit so we got somebody to go around to the family home and drop off some information about services and support that might still be available how people were adapting again activities that people might want to do um, in the family home to try and be proactively kind of giving some of those messages so um, I think we've got a range of information available to us that allows us to identify. Again, I think this, there's opportunities for that to get better. Um, I'm pretty keen um, uh, to try and make sure that we get the health visiting contacts, the mandated checks in there, so that, again, we can use that as another area for um, identifying those who might benefit from that low-level support. Um, so I think, I think, actually, we've got a lot of information that does enable us to identify those that will benefit from that. Um, the bit we need to do, I think, is make sure that actually we're clear about um, how are those families then being supported. So there's a number of different ways we do that through proactive home visits, through actual um, family support services that might be provided, or equally through some of the hubs that we deliver in some of the localities like the Centre and Inclusion Hubs, for example. No, thank you for that. I think I, that's, that's really encouraging to hear that. Um, just on that note, though, sometimes that wealth of information and data can be very difficult to ne uh, negotiate your way through. And whilst it might be uh, useful uh, if we are reacting to something, is that data or do we have the ability to deep dive for want of a better description into uh, that data uh, or that intelligence to be able to act um, proactively rather than reactively? Yeah, so um, we haven't done it for some time um uh, now, but we did used to do a pro predictive analytics report, which basically took all of that data and tried to analyse it and tell you what are the factors or, or kind of support that might help children or that flag to us that actually children are going to be known to the system. And um, at the time, there were a number of things that, things that, that flagged up. Um, so, for example, we know that children who don't attend um, school are much more likely to become known to the system. So a lot of that kind of predictive analytic work that we did has kind of driven some of the behaviour and some of the um, support that we've got in place now. So it, it kind of absolutely, and, and again, it's probably one of the reasons why attendance is mentioned in the strategy, because we know that actually it has a major impact. So yes, it is done. It's probably not done as frequently as we need it to be. Um, and again, that's probably something we need to include as, as part of the JSNA, really, as we move forward. So I'll pick that up. 
Uh, thank you for that. I, uh, to be honest, I think that sounds really encouraging, the fact that we have that process and we are uh, using it um, in that way. If, uh, yeah. Councillor McMahon. Uh, th thank you. Um, the 26% the, the that, that, that um, Julian Pardesi referred to um, is interesting. And Natasha, you've just referred to those who persistently don't attend school, and, that, and that's greater than 10% in this report. And, likely, and likewise, greater than 10% um, of parents have um, mental health issues. So clearly, the, 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 um, and, and those are just three parameters. Uh, so clearly, the, the, um, the scale of the task for early intervention is pretty significant. Um, given that, there's, there's two points for me. G given that, uh, uh, are, are you, do you ever get the impression that people think you're interfering because you're having to um, approach families that may be resistant to help in the first place, because many of these sort of families are, who, um, um, who live in a culture where they don't think there's anything wrong? Uh, and um, uh, 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 and yet clearly need help and support in order for their for their youngsters to um, uh, to have a better chance in life, and I just wonder if that's an issue. The second thing is that this that this whole strategy, which I fully endorse, I, I agree with the chair entirely, um, mm -hmm. s strikes me is 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 entirely dependent on collaboration between organisations. Now. The, the local, the, the, the new child strategy with a local approach and the family centres clearly helps that. But again and again and again, we see in in social care broadly, um, it's it's the lack of communication between organisations that trips us up. And, and I, I just wonder, over and above the child strategy, what else you can do in order to make sure that that communication remains in place. Um, so that um, so that you really can deliver, and also the first point about about the the, the interference issue. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so um, in relation to the interference thing, it's really interesting, Johnny, because um, actually I I think that a lot of families feel that we come with a certain sense of judgment. Um, and, and so I think their resistance sometimes is because you're coming in to tell me what to do and therefore I've got my heckles up. Um, and actually, um, a really good strategy that I saw another local authority talk about the other day was just kind of doing a morning routine and filming it and saying, um, you know, this is how it looked and this is how it should have looked and, and kind of reducing some of that us and them um, kind of approach because actually when I looked at that morning routine it was something that my family could have gone through you know you're all screaming to get out the door so actually it isn't an us and them thing I think it is about us being equals and having that conversation based on the fact that we are all here to help and support and no one's got this nailed you know it doesn't come with a rule book you know everybody um, being a parent can think of a million things that they would have done differently kind of looking back on it and so I think when we when we do that and we're using something called restorative practice, which is much more about working with the families and trying to understand from their perspective what are the, what are the support needs that you think are most important to you and your family. Actually, the reluctance to engage, I think, is significantly reduced. I mean, there'll always be some, um, don't get me wrong, but actually I think we are we're doing a very good job of making sure that families who need our help and support are engaging. I think your, your kind of other point around the partnership aspect, so the partners are critical to this. We can't do it without them. And, and as Mark said, I think, in his introduction, this is everybody's responsibility. It's not a local authority's job. It's everybody as, as a part to play in this. And so, actually, for me and my family growing up, I know that some of that help and support came from a parent and toddler group. I know it came from a faith group. I know it came from a school teacher in a school. And so, actually, everybody needs to know, understand, and own their stake in it. And, and again, I think that reduces some of that resistance to engage because these are people who've got that relationship and trusted you know are trusted by you anyway and actually are not seen in the same way as perhaps a local authority might be so I think the two kind of points around actually um, the partners and that resistance to change are kind of one and the same thing so we have got an awful lot of work to do to make sure that everybody understands and owns their stake in this and it's not just about the formal early help assessment it's about actually everybody knowing and understanding how they can offer some of that help and support early enough. In, in terms of communication, so the, the strategy is the first part, isn't it? Um, and undoubtedly, um, the hard work starts after, and that will be in, in the form of a, a kind of implementation plan, which we get the partners to sign up to. 
Um, I would imagine there'll be a number of themes that run throughout that that are similar to what we find when we do a, a kind of learning review when a child dies. And, and there will be things like communication, information sharing, all of those things that, like you say, are sometimes the, the easier things that sometimes trip us up. So I think part of that plan needs to focus on communication. And again, I'll make sure that that's picked up as part of the delivery of the implementation plan. Thank you, though. Councillor Wilcock. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, and um, Councillor McMahon mentioned about the collaboration and communication being paramount to any of these things working. And um, from someone who's only been on the County Council, you know, 12 months, but we seem to hear, I seem to hear constantly that we, we seem to be great at putting these strategies together, uh, these interventions, and, and, and yet we seem to hear also, we're not there yet with the communication or the joined up thinking. And part of me thinks, are we, are we putting the cart before the horse? Should we not, first of all, make sure that all the partner organisations, and if you, if you look on slide 18, there's a whole raft of them that you've identified there. Should we not make sure first that all these are, are lined up and we have a, a proper channel of communication in place? Because these strategies are brilliant, but we still hear of children that, are, that fall through the net or tragic cases that are going on and, and, and there's all and it's always the point coming back that well organizations didn't talk to each other and, and they're not we're not quite there yet and I just wonder whether um, some sort of exercising in making sure that we've got a, a clear channel of um, dialogue between all the partners before we put a strategy together because the strategy is great but if the partners don't play into it and communicate with each other then we're still going to find ourselves in the situation where children um, are being neglected or, or, or fall through the net because one organisation doesn't talk to another one or doesn't know that this new strategy is in place. So, um, so it's a really good point you make. So partners have been part of the development of the strategy. So um, let me just kind of be really clear. Actually, partners are saying we need this strategy, we want it. This needs to be the starter of us working better to meet the needs of children. I suppose... Uh, my challenge back would be without that strategy you kind of lose some of that coherence to some of the partnership engagement and I think this is is really kind of the first step the other thing I'd say is that I don't think this work will ever stop I mean I've been working for Staffordshire County Council now for 14 years and in that time there is always changes to people professionals different people you know kind of coming into the system going out of the system things that are externally funded that you've got no control of so the, the ecosystem of support really does change and I don't think these are things that will ever stop. So I don't. I think if we waited for it to all to be done to do the strategy first, I'm not sure we'd quite get there. So I think we need the strategy first to provide that kind of guiding light to get us all kind of pointing in the same direction. And then I think you're right, we do need a really strong kind of implementation plan. And, you know, as a, a kind of child who, who grew up in Staffordshire, I'm really committed to making a difference, not through the piece of paper, because that, that really is, is, like I say, the first block. There's probably another 20 that come after that. And, and I really do want to make a difference for those children, young people and families. And so, you know, that implementation plan for me is the, the most important thing. And kind of coming back and saying to ourselves in 12 months' time, right, so where are we? Let's take stock. Actually, how far have we come? What yet have we still got left to do? Because I don't think this work will ever, ever finish or, or, or kind of stop, really. Uh, okay, well, given all that you say, so once, once the strategy is, is developed and ready to go, how do we ensure, or what's the mechanism to make sure that all these other organisations know what we're doing and where, where their part is in, in play and, and how they can sort of refer on and get into? Um, so we had just that conversation. So we've got an early help place-based approach group, which is a partnership board that meets um, every month and talks about how we can kind of better deliver early help and place-based working. And we asked the partners at the most recent meeting, how are you going to communicate this within your organisation? Quite a few of them said, actually, they don't need to go through a formal process like this, but they would benefit from some help and support in terms of kind of presentation slides, briefing notes for, that can go out to staff and the workforce. So I think there's a big kind of communication campaign to start with in terms of getting all of the people within their organisation, not just the person who is part of the development of the strategy, to know and understand what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, and then I think, the, like I say, the, the kind of development of the delivery plan will be done by that partnership and again overseen by the early help place-based um, operational group, which reports into the Health and Wellbeing Board ultimately. Um, and again, we take um, annual reports in terms of how we're progressing in delivery. So I would expect them to hold us accountable for the delivery of that implementation plan. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Um, first, I'm really heartened by the fact that you see this as, a, as, an, as an ongoing thing. 
because there's no strategy that's perfect, however good it might be, and 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 it's and it's an iterative process that keeps changing, and I and I, I think that's the, exactly the right attitude to take to that. <coughs> it, it it just picking up Mike Wilcox's piece again, again, if I may. Um, I, I think that one of the one of the further challenges to this, and, and it's a, a challenge that's inherent in the, in, in the system, um, is, um, is working from home and online stuff. And, and it, I would actively encourage the, the multi-agencies to meet together um, in person on a regular basis within the footfall that you've described in your, in your strategy as a whole. Um, in order for that to, um, in, 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 or, in order for that communication to be l um, less at risk, um, because it's all about relationships at the end of the day. No matter what the strategy might be, it's all about relationships, and there's nothing like meeting people in person to do that. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, just a couple of things, just to finish off then. Um, I think the the, uh, the way that it's shown on pages 14 and 15 is um, uh, obviously it's led to quite a bit of uh, debate. Um, is there any means of because should, I, rather than this being sort of a a binary description, you know, that three people would be living in uh, a household where there's an alcoholic or, and ten would be absent from school? Um, I dare say that some of these young people probably feature in all of these boxes, don't they? I mean, are, are the 26 that aren't ready for school, are three of them living in households with alcoholics? Are, are there 10 of them that are not present at school and, and all of that? So rather than give uh, an, a, an impression that there are, however many all of this adds up to, individual children suffering from this, I dare say it's probably a smaller number that are suffering from a large number of these particular things. Um, if there is, and I think it goes back to, I, I do apologise, uh, I think it goes back to the point that you were saying there about uh, being able to look at that intelligence uh, and therefore identify those perhaps with multiple um, issues around, um, around some of this. Um, I also think that is there a, any means of some sort of a performance measure uh, because I know that uh, Mark made the point as we move forward that um, whilst some of these uh, facts and figures are quite worrying and concerning, they do appear to be a lot better than other areas and a lot better than we were perhaps a short while ago. Um, is there any means of demonstrating our success? Because purely this strategy must be about how we bring some of these adverse uh, figures, figures down. So would it be possible to include in a strategy some idea of uh, progress that is being made really as a performance measure around just how good that strategy is? Um, and I also think it would be remiss to finish on a note where it appears negative because we do, I think it is a good strategy, I think we've all um, agreed that. Um, we've made the point about organisations working together, that's one that is always going to be uh, a challenge. Uh, but also, when I look through the figures there, um, you know, the fact that 26 young people aren't ready for school, but 85% of them go on to sustained educational destinations. So, presumably, some of those people must have gone through a system that has helped recognise them and helped to get them to uh, a reasonable educational standard. So, I do think it, you, know, the, you can interpret those figures not only as quite worrying at times, but also... Uh, we are doing something right because we are getting that you know, uh, view of people moving on. So um, uh, as per the recommendation, I think it, it was about us scrutinising and giving feedback. Um, I think we've done that, but I think in general, um, I would say that the, the strategy appears to be the right one, and, uh, and, and I do think it's quite encouraging uh, everything that uh, we've heard this morning uh, about how we're moving that forward and taking it forward. Councillor Sutton. Just, I mean, just to pick up on your, 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 your point about the, um, <clears throat> the 26 children that don't achieve a good level of development. Um, and, of course, it's, a bi it's, it's very binary, isn't it? 
They either do or they don't. So we don't know from this how many were miles and miles away or, and how many were more or less more, 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 or less, more or less there. But I certainly take on board your point about the sort of more cumulative effect of having, you know, of being in two or three of these or four or five or particularly the, 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 neg the negative ones and whether we can uh, um, use that to show um, how well we are doing or hopefully not, but, you know, where, where there's areas for development go going forward. And I'll sit down with Natasha and how... Uh, and how, how, how we make it, uh, it more useful. But what, we certainly, what I certainly will not be doing is, is making this any, more, any longer. Uh, if anything, it will be considerably sh sh shorter. Uh, and we'll look at the way we can present things in a more, slightly more concise way so that it does not become a strategy that just used to keep doors open. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I, I I don't know if we still use the phrase, but didn't we used to call them ACEs, adverse child experiences or something like that? Was that one of those things, or is that is that old hat now? Yeah, it is. I mean, the evidence base on ACEs is really mixed, so um, there's, there's loads of discussion that's kind of happened around um, adverse childhood experiences, and, and you're absolutely right, they do have a, an impact. I think what we could maybe do better on that, that kind of slide, uh, those kind of pages really around the data is maybe demonstrate those that are meeting multiple as opposed to kind of single um, kind of outcome areas. So we'll we'll look to try and pick that up. Um, the stuff around adverse childhood experiences as well is um, they come back and they say actually people are really good at identifying them, but they don't know what to do with them once they know about them. <laughs> so the evidence on the so what what do we do about it is still really um, early in its in its kind of development. So yeah, maybe we could make reference to that um, through the strategy. Thank you. I, I, again, though, I think we you know we shouldn't move away from the fact that it is a really good report and it looks like we're moving in the right direction. Councillor Wilcox, I think you want to. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, 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 yeah, I want to finish on a positive note as well because I think it's a great strategy and, and I think the early help is, is so important that we get it embedded and put in. And I just wonder, just wondering from a member point of view, whether when the strategy is ready, whether we could either have a, a member briefing or a, an information sheet that we could give to members because members are... are you know, as, as much involved in this as other partner organisations, we come into contact with all these organisations and maybe um, a training session or a session where we can bring all members together to say, you know, this is a, a great new strategy we want to launch. With your help, we can do that because we're all involved in parish and towns and districts and whatever. And I just think it's an opportunity for all the members of the council, not just this committee, to understand and to see the, the great work that's going on. Sure. I think that's a really good point uh, and a good point to finish on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and thanks for bringing the report. Some feedback and complaints annual report, children's social care. Um, we have these reports come um, every year. Uh, I wonder if someone, because they, they're, they're quite lengthy and quite heavily, heavy on statistics, I just wondered if perhaps somebody could talk us through them. So just a, a quick introduction from myself then, if that's uh, okay, Mr. 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 Chairman. Uh, as you've said, um, it's an annu <coughs> annual, annual review and it refers just to the um, uh, section that relates to children um, children and, 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 and families. Uh, and, and Kate is here to take, um, take you through the... Um, the bones of the report, and I'm sure he's able to uh, answer in, de uh, in detail any questions that the uh, the committee might have. Good morning. I'm here to present the Children and Families uh, Complaints Annual Report. There is only a statutory duty to present um, the issues that are covered by the Children Act, but because we felt it advantageous that the whole service is represented, represented. We also include SEND, which is the corporate complaints procedure. The procedure for a statutory complaint for children's services is very uh, long and laborious. There's a stage one, which is a investigation done by the team manager. That takes up to 25 working days. 
if the complainant remains dissatisfied, they have the opportunity to escalate to a stage two independent investigation, which is up to 65 working days. And then if they're unhappy with that, they can go to independent panel, which is stage three, and then off to the ombudsman. As you know, you know, I'll just give you the time scales. For someone to make a complaint about children's services could take a, a really long time to get to the end of it. So we do try to resolve things as soon as we possibly can. As you can see within the report, we've had a total of 237 complaints across the whole service area. That's statutory and corporate. Corporate is very much a do it once, do it right attitude. From a council perspective, we're able to actually say what our corporate processes look like. Corporate is um, up to 15 working days. And then for stage two, if the complainant feels that we haven't covered all angles, we can review that. But if we've covered all angles and they just remain dissatisfied, it's off to the ombudsman. Um, the stage two part of the statutory, obviously, not only the time scale, but the costs associated to the public purse, the complaints team do get involved with the complainant and the team manager to try and stop the complaint escalating to stage two. We are successful in a high number of those um, because, you know, 65 working days to come to the end of that process is a long, long time to wait for an outcome to a complaint. We also try to ensure that when the complaint comes in, we risk assess it. Is it really a complaint? Is it something that we can resolve now? And as you will see within the report, we do a lot of duty work, which, you know, the com complaint can just be, my social worker hasn't contacted me, I've not had a copy of the report. So we don't put that in the process, we deal with it. So therefore, it's something that's done, dusted, resolved. And if the complainant isn't happy, we will include that in a process, but we do our best to do that early resolution of the services. So as you will see within the report, as I've said previously, we've got 237 complaints as a whole. If you look at the services provided, uh, which is on page 26, we've had a small proportion of complaints in respect of the amount of service that has been provided. Um, the, the, the report itself is a positive report. The numbers remain consistent. From a corporate side, the SEND and Derby Help complaints have have, have escalated. Last year, they came down, but of course we've had transformation in the middle of that, which has caused some um, disruption in the ways of working, not only in relation to provision, but also in the relation to the way the complaints procedures have been actually adhered to. So the complaints team have had to do a lot of work with the districts to ensure that the complaint responses are going out on time, they're going out and they are evidence-based. Um, so we can ensure that our processes are being adhered to. Ultimate, as always, is the Ombudsman. Uh, and unfortunately, this year, this year we've seen three public reports, two of which were in relation to SEND. The Ombudsman had seen that the issues that were being raised had all had previously been raised within the council and therefore they felt that a public report was uh, needed. Um, this was presented at formal cabinet, well they were all three were presented at formal cabinet and the third one was in relation to my decision making. I stand by my decision making but you know that's the way forward and we have to be open and honest with everyone that are stakeholders towards that procedure. Ultimately, the Ombudsman own, uh, hold elected members responsible for our complaints procedures and the way we handle them. Hence, you know, reports coming to both yourselves and formal cabinet. Um, obviously, numbers are very important, but what's more important is the outcomes. 
So you'll see within the report we had 20% of stage one's investigations upheld. We had 38% of stage one's not upheld. And then we had 42% partially upheld. Partially upheld is where you would have more than one issue being investigated. So you would have perhaps the first part upheld, but the second part not upheld. Um, you know, so um, compliments, of course, are very important. We celebrate compliments. Our frontline staff that go out to do those jobs every day uh, go out to do a very emotional job. Uh, especially in children's services, and therefore getting 197 compliments is a, is a, is a real positive. Um, we do also deal with MP and public inquiries. This year, our, public en our MP inquiries are through the roof, to be honest, to be completely honest. Um, and for children's services, we had 117, which was up from 77 in the previous year. Um, important to note that our MPs, when they come into us, only see one side of the story. So it's very important that the MP responses are factual and we go back with the way forward as much as possible. The MP responses, the MP inquiries are di directed to John Henderson in the main. We know that they go to councillors as well. Um, and John reads every response before it goes out um, to make comments, to raise concerns about what's within those uh, inquiries, etc., etc. So overall, I think it's a very positive report, but obviously happy to accept any questions. Councillor Wilcox. Uh, thank you. Mine's just a clarification. I might have missed this. And um, what's the difference between a statutory stage one and a corporate stage one, please? Statutory stage one is anything, any service that we provide under the Children Act. So that would be safeguarding, fostering, adoption, those sorts of services. Corporate would just be send because it's not covered by the Children Act. Okay, somebody more. Um, th there, is a, there is a point in the report where it says, and this is where I get confused about the corporate and the, <laughs> and the statutory as well, that uh, if, 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 if they're not satisfied with stage one, they want to go to stage two, but the stage two has declined. Is that just corporate or is that both? And, and the, the, the reason I asked the question is that um, it then goes on to say, that the, the, the complainant then has the option to go to the ombudsman. How often has that happened and the ombudsman has upheld the complaint? Because that will give us some idea of just how robust our internal processes are. So um, corporate stage two for statutory, any of the statutory complaints procedure we can't say no to. Hence us going out at if a uh, complainant requests a stage two independent statutory investigation. Stage two review for corporate we can say no to and that would be if the complaint hasn't fully been responded to we would say yes to that. We have to bear in mind that some of our complainants are not happy with a response but if when a complaint comes in, we define a complaint, so we all know what we're investigating. So therefore, they will know what the investigation is about, what they're asking us to look at. And if we've done all of that, and they come back to say, I'm not happy, they've got to have legitimate reasons to say why they're not happy. If everything's been concluded, we then say, sorry, no stage two, off to the ombudsman. It's very rare we have the Ombudsman coming back to us to say, you have not concluded your processes. That's what the Ombudsman would first look at, whether or not we've concluded our processes. And that's precisely why I asked the question, because they're interested in process, not just the decision. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, so, so has there been any of this th in the year that we're discussing? Top of my head, I would say no. Councillor Partition. 
Thank you, Chair. Page 48, just for reassurance, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this, Kate. Under the relationships box, it says the majority of feedback within the corporate complaints procedure is from parents of young people, but there's very minimal contact from young people themselves. But presumably, hopefully, we have a process in place where young people's voice can be heard if it needs to be? Thank you, yes we do. We have lots of contact from advocates who support young people. We also have children's voice projects that um, assist as well. Um, we do have a tech service which, is no, which nobody uses, unfortunately. Um, you know, but we do try and advocate that you know you can make a complaint. We used to have a free phone number as well, um, but young people don't seem want to seem to want to engage with us directly. Um, but we do pick up um, concerns by advocates and the Voice Project. Thank you for that. Am I right in assuming that some people just simply want to get to the ombudsman? And uh, because it, it just concerns me, some of the figures, they, you know, the 20% of uh, complaints upheld and then another 40% partially upheld, so that's well over 60% are either upheld or partially up, upheld, and that does therefore tend to paint a picture that we might be doing something wrong if we're getting that much um, uh, a problem with it. And then I seem to remember last year you were talking about people want an ombudsman uh, judgment? I think we need to also talk about and understand lessons learned. When a complaint is upheld, a le we need to learn lessons from it or any complaint coming in because there must be an issue if somebody wants to complain. You know, they may have, they'll ha obviously have a different view on the way a service has been provided. Lessons learned are very important and we are part of a monthly meeting that Natasha's team actually pulls together so that lessons learned are um, distributed across children and families so it doesn't just sit within one team. So if there's an issue within the safeguarding team, that recommendation and that lesson learned goes through the whole of children and families now, which is a real positive for us because, you know, especially now that the teams are district-based and the services are within those districts, those recommendations need to go throughout that service and throughout the other services because they're all based on the same district model. Quite a few people want to get to the Ombudsman. We can uphold a complaint within the statutory procedure through all levels of stage one, two and three. A lot of people, and this is, I'm trying not to generalise now, like to get to the Ombudsman because there's a chance that they will be awarded financial recompense. If we think financial recompense is needed, we will. The Ombudsman's mantra is put that complainant back in the position they would have been if we hadn't made that mistake. Sometimes they will award time, trouble and distress and that's £250 for each part, time, trouble and distress. We also have to bear in mind that there are times where we do get it wrong and there's a lot more money awarded than, would, than we would have wanted to, but we have to recognise that the Ombudsman is saying you, you're at fault. If we think about the public reports that we've had, we were at fault. Uh, thank you. It just strikes me as that may frustrate the process if all people want to do is see money at the end and, 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 and try to get to the uh, get to the ombudsman. Um, just a couple of other things as well. About 62% within the time scales. Um, that doesn't sound a high percentage. Is there? Are, are we doing something wrong there? Is there something that we could improve? Bear in mind, most people who complain, I'm sure if we respond quickly before they have time to think about it over and over and over again, and then it becomes you know, a, a difficult situation to, uh, 
to, uh, to get through. Can, is there anything we should be doing about 62%? We are having conversations uh, with, um, uh, sorry, the, the new uh, Director of Children's Services, Neelan, about the opportunity to be more prevalent within the service areas. As I've mentioned previously, the children's transformation has sort of knocked our ways of working. 62% um, uh, is lower than last year, but we also have to bear in mind this is on the top of the day-to-day that um, our districts, our district colleagues, um, you know, a, a, child, a children's safeguarding issue will obviously come before a complaint response, et cetera, et cetera. And that was one of the reasons we put in the duty uh, role within the complaints team, because we don't want, we want them to deal with the complaints that need dealing with, that lessons learned need to be learned from, not the minutiae of I've not had a phone call back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do agree, every year we talk about this and the percentage goes down, the percentage in respect of uh, timescales goes down. Like I say, we do talk about it and uh, perhaps we need to be a bit more, or I need to be a bit more active in respect of pushing that forward. Please don't criticise yourself. I think it's a difficult job. Councillor Wilcox. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, given the positive um, slant that you mentioned, the fact that complaints are down, which, which is really good, and, and obviously more stage ones are getting um, dealt with effectively, so they're not going to stage two. Is there any one thing that you think you're doing differently now that's resulting from less complaints coming forward? Do, do you think that the service you offer has changed in any way, or, or are there any lessons learned from what you're doing that will say, actually, because we're doing this, we are seeing less complaints coming forward. I think uh, lessons learned and the fact that these are be being disseminated throughout the service and restorative practice, as Natasha was talking about earlier, that has made a big difference. The fact that we attempt to resolve things in a, in a timely manner as well is um, is a is a big con well is a big positive in my mind. You know, nobody wants to complain. People don't want to complain. We have to provide a service that is open, open to everyone, and we have to take even the smallest issue and try and resolve it. People that require com or want to complain are people that are in a situation that is really hard for them at this time. As Natasha was saying earlier, when she was presenting, you know, people don't want that knock at the door. And therefore, you know, it is something that we want to work with them in order to reduce the amount coming in. Just on that, do you find that you have any, are there any serial complainants who constantly, and if they are, are they recorded every time one is resolved and they come back, is that then another complaint or do you sort of band these um, people together? We have a number of complainants who we call unreasonably persistent and that wouldn't, you know, we don't name or label them lightly. It's got to be where we're in a position where we are receiving a lot of complaints about the same issue that we've already responded to, etc., etc. We have to have an evidence-based decision and therefore I collect that evidence and then I go to the monitoring officer in respect of that. Um, and the monitoring officer makes that decision if they are to be unreasonably persistent. We've just introduced, along with our legal services, a, um, a process where, which will cover elected members as well when, when you are having contact from unreasonably persistent complainers too. Um, it's a three-way way of working between ourselves and the complaints team, our health and safety team, and also our legal services. So yes, we do have them. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sutton. I mean, I just wanted to add something fa fairly general uh, from the perspective that um, um, on a number of occasions, people try and complain um, because it's the outcome of whatever we've done they don't like, as opposed to potentially how we went about it. And, and, and quite often, there are cases that uh, matters, but people come, that we can't 
we can't investigate, can't do it, because it was a decision taken by, by, the, by, by, the, by the court uh, and not by, by ourselves. And a lot of child protection issues uh, eventually end up in the, in, in, in the court. So the decision is not something, I'm right, I think I'm right in saying I'd claim, it's something that they can actually complain uh, about. And ultimately, for some people, that's the nub of their complaint, isn't it? Are we not able, therefore, to reflect that in the figures, then, Mark? Because um, if there are certain things that are beyond our control, then surely, to get a better understanding of this, we should reflect those in, in here. Those figures would be in the refusals, the refusal to investigate. Um, we have, we also have a lot of grandparents wishing to make complaints because they can't have access to them, children, etc., etc. And we have to do a lot of work in refusing a complaint because we have to have that evidence base because people can go to the ombudsman. We have to give them a way forward. And whilst we would sympathise with the situation they're in, if they've got no si significant interest or that decision has been made in court, we can't say, we can't, we can't agree. Just a couple of other quick things as well. I, 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 and I think you alluded to it um, when you were going through the report, this uh, incredible increase in MPs uh, getting involved, are they? Is that a duplication? Is that someone adding some strength to a complaint that they've already made? Or is it a, you know, a, a negative reflection on the trust and confidence in our complaints process that they now go to an MP rather than use the uh, proper, proper procedures? Email makes it very easy for a complainant to scattergun their complaints. So therefore, we would have an email that perhaps would be to ourselves, copying in John Henderson, copying in um, Councillor Sutton. Um, and therefore, from that, the MP would pick up that inquiry. When I first started doing MP inquiries, which were about six years ago, we had 70. This year, we're just under 1,000. And that's covering the whole of the council. Obviously, um, that includes corporate issues, potholes, flooding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, we are seeing a constant rise in uh, in inquiries coming in. Yeah, I, 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 is there any means then of rationalisation around that? You know, can we write to all these people to say that it's being dealt with, and we'll just deal with the complainant, or, 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 or is that me being naive? No, if, if they're in a process, that's what we go back and say. Um, we try to ensure that there is a one response from the council. Otherwise, it gets very messy, very time-consuming. Hence, MP inquiries, complaints, public inquiries for SLT all come into to the team so we can ensure there's one response to the complainant um, and we would then copy in the MP. What we don't want is different people responding to different parts. And it's the same with people being unreasonably persistent. The response will from the council will come from me. They might copy in elected members, but that response will come from me. Uh, thank you for that. And finally, on, on page 39, and I think it was alluded to in the earlier report, um, if you look at that Pareto type analysis, you know, that says that 80% of the problems caused by 20% of the cause. Um, it appears to be early help resourcing and education and assessment and staying together. Uh, and you talked about lessons learned and the importance of that in, in, in moving forwards. Can we be reassured that in those two particular areas, because it seems like if we were to uh, manage to resolve the issues there, then our, our complaints would be drastically reduced, wouldn't they? Of course, early help includes SEND, um, and at the moment, we are receiving a high number of complaints in respect of SEND. Um, the, during the transformation, the SEND teams have gone to a district base, so therefore, 
they've got a different way of working as well. They're not within a team. And in some cases, uh, expertise has been lost. So last year, we saw a drastic reduction in SEND. This year, that's where the increase lies. Um, so hopefully, we will see a positive next year. We've had the two formal responses, uh, formal reports from the Ombudsman, one being about the lack of timely response to an EHCP, and I know that the service are working really hard to bring that up, uh, you know, those, those timescales up to a reasonable level. Um, so we are hopeful, we are doing our best to ensure from a complaint side that those responses go out in a timely manner, and more importantly, that there is a way forward for the complainant. Thank you. I, I suppose the other thing that concerns me really about that is that if, if we lose some people and some expertise and then we lose our ability to respond, where, where, where's the corporate memory in all of this? Where, how do we record, save, be able to um, mitigate some of these things? It, 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 it's just a bit worrying if, if all of that expertise walks out the door and there's no corporate memory about what what we do with these things. I think uh, talking particularly about the, um, the, 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 the send issues and the, the, dis the district hubs, I think uh, uh, anyone that's been through a, um, a major change, change process, there are things that take place in that, different ways of working, people working with new colleagues in different ways, different lines of management and, su and, and, and supervision, which probably has impacted a little bit more in this, this area than it has in, 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 in other areas. But I think that the overall advantage of having those send key workers and all that within district model so that they all work together on a district, district basis as opposed um, all you know, all the all the send key workers doing their assessments together in complete isolation, with the impact, with isolation of that early help and that um, is not the right is not the right thing to do. So having them all to, having them on a district based model is the right thing to do, and I'm confident that this you know what we we've seen will be overcome when we get a that model embedded a little bit more around 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 send but there's no doubt that the massive amount of increase that we have in requestments for educational and health and care plans um, does impact on a little bit on the time ta the timeliness to be able to do those in an e in, in an effective way and i would Although I don't get those details, Jonathan, does I suspect that quite a lot of the SEND-type complaints are around timeliness of educational health and care plans. Uh, thank you for that. I don't think there's any other questions. Um, Kate, thank you again for coming and um, facing the barrage of questions around statistics. Uh, I, I, a really good report and, and, and very encouraging to hear um, how we're you know, trying to manage what is often a very difficult uh, process and uh, procedures so uh, thank you again thank you. and uh, I, on a similar note but this time it's uh, adult uh, complaints perhaps Kate you could run us through oh sorry Julia did you want to open for us Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I'll do a brief introduction, uh, but before I start, I would like to express my thanks to Kate and her team for the very professional way they deal with often very difficult circumstances. Uh, and I think, as the report has alluded to, the last the, the year of this report, access to staff in the service areas has been quite difficult because of sickness, because of COVID. Um, and in many ways, I think this report was a pleasant surprise to me because knowing that at one stage we'd got 70 care homes that were closed to um, new admissions because of COVID, um, home care services were restricted. Um, you know, it just goes to show 
how those who actually are at the sharp end work so well that actually we haven't seen a great escalation in complaints. It has been a difficult year, but I think all those involved have worked extremely hard. Uh, but I know it has been quite difficult for the complaints team because of that access to uh, staff to be able to move the complaints process on. So I'd like to make that as a general comment. And as you can see from the data, um, the figures for 21-22 uh, are very similar to the previous year and less than the what I call the pre-pandemic years. Um, so in many ways, that's a really good sign. Um, as Kate has explained with children's services, there is a culture of trying to deal with complaints uh, on an informal and a quick and simple basis. The complaints process is a long-winded process which can be quite traumatic for the complainants and, and if it's a simple issue, the sooner it's dealt with, the better. Um, and I think that is all credit to the managers within the service. Um, as I say, when you, you look at the, the complaints uh, as a whole, um, and the report does allude to the top three areas of complaints, uh, and this is similar to last year, which is delays in receiving the service, and I think COVID did have an impact on that. Um, it was difficult for people wanting nursing and care home placements because so many homes were close to admissions and it was difficult to actually try to get people in the home of their choice. Uh, poor communication, I've yet to come across any organisation that's got that particular nut cracked, but it doesn't mean that we, we have to try harder. Um, I think there are circumstances, particularly, and it relates to the third area, which is financial assessments, where it is a difficult area. It's difficult for staff, and I'm sure staff find it far more difficult to go through financial assessments than others. Um, and also the individual concerned and their carers or relatives. It's often quite a traumatic time, and sometimes they don't want to hear what they're being told. But it is an area that I do believe we need to concentrate on more because with the changes that are coming with the new Social Care Act, there are going to be an increased number of assessments because people can ask the local authority to organise their care rather than, you know, do it privately. Um, so I am conscious that the demands on the service are going to be greater and we do need to make sure that in communicating those assessments and the financial aspects that we provide support to our staff and to the individuals concerned that there are timely assessments and that the messages we give are clear and understandable and actually reinforced by a written message. We've all been in situations a little bit traumatic where people give us information. Two hours later, you're not actually quite sure what they said. You need it in writing so that you can go through it. So I think there are always lessons to be learnt, but I think it's imperative now that we actually review that system and make sure that it's as timely, effective, and as efficient as possible. Um, so, uh, Kate, as before, will we'll answer any detailed questions and just go through an overview of the report. Um, but those are the things that I've picked up, and I've al already started those conversations um, so that we can review those processes. Thank you, Chairman. No, thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you for that. Um, Kate, if you'd perhaps take us through. I, I don't want to rehearse all of the issues that we perhaps had common to both of the reports, but um, if you could pick out the salient points, thank you. So the adults annual report, again, is a statutory annual report, and it's from the 2009 health and care regulations. And what should happen with this complaints procedure is that it's a joint procedure with our health colleagues. 
So therefore, if I give you a scenario, you've got a, a, a lady or a patient in hospital, there's a problem in hospital, she comes to discharge, there's an issue with discharge, she's discharged with a package of care that fails, we should be providing one response, even though it's different uh, partners as you go through that. Now that doesn't always happen. In the complaints world, um, I'm very lucky, I've got a very constant team. But in other, world, in, in other organisations, you don't always have a constant team. And therefore, people don't always understand the meaning of the regulations. We also have to be aware that our frontline social care is provided by MPFT, who are a health foundation trust. And therefore, we have to work quite closely with them on a number of issues. Whilst they provide that front line, the statutory duty to provide sits with the council and therefore ultimately the ombudsman and our elected members. So we have to be well aware of that. Again, if a complaint comes in, we risk assess. Is it a complaint? Is it a safeguarding? As you'll see within the figures, uh, we passed five to our safeguarding team because we felt they were safeguarding. Is it something that we can deal with quite quickly? And again, if we can, we will. So that's a real positive. For this one, it's very much the strap line on this is do it once, do it right. And that's something that I would advocate for every time. I am also happy, while it's not in the regulations, if someone comes back and says, hold on a minute, I'm not, I don't agree with what's been said, my team are quite happy to have conversations to say, um, okay, then, you know, tell us what your, what, what your view is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can also go independent on investigations within these regulations. And as you can see, we've had two independent investigations. And this is usually if there's an issue within a care home or someone somewhere has passed away within our care at that time. Uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. Harling and um, Joe Coucher. They are the positive within complaints. You know, you always need someone at SLT level. Um, they're very passionate about complaints and lessons learned are a big thing for them, whether it's MPFT or whether it's ourselves. Um, and I have quite a few conversations with Richard about how we're going to deal with things, what's the best way forward, and how we're going to ensure that lessons, there are lessons learned about this. In fact, in September, we've got one of my independents coming in to look at how we've dealt with a complaint and how, and to ensure that we have lessons learned. That's a current issue which has a knock-on effect coming from COVID, uh, but it's something that we are, or, or from an adult social care perspective, are passionate about. You know, if people make complaints, we need to take them seriously and learn lessons from them. Um, again, um, ultimate is the ombudsman. Um, we're a few less this year. Um, we have quite a lot about financial um, assessments and um, as not responding in a timely manner or the first invoice not being within the timely manner. And I do agree with Councillor Jessel. We do have a few concerns there. If I give you an example, I'm a uh, appropriate adult. If you're called out at three o'clock in the morning and someone has to go into respite, a social worker having a conversation about contributing to those care charges is a really hard conversation to have at that time because they're in a, a state of um, well, they don't want to be in the situation they're being. They just want to be care and support, you know, around them. So therefore, I think there is a bit, a lot more work to do on that. Um, we have very good working relationships with all county council adult social care teams. Uh, we have monthly meetings in respect of lessons learned um, and also um, challenging debt at the moment. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on. We're very lucky to be included within these scenarios or these situations because then when a complaint comes in, we know what's happening. We know what's, and we can work with them on that. Um, 
Again, very comprehensive report. For me, if you look at the services we've provided over the past 12 months, a very positive complaints report, but obviously happy to accept any uh, questions. Council Wilcox. Uh, thank you, Chairman. First of all, you have my total admiration for the work you do and your colleagues. I come from an industry that had to deal with constant complaints on a daily basis, so I really do, you know, applaud and appreciate the work, the work that you do. Um, just on one of the slides, on page 75, where you talk about 36% of complaints received with poor communication or delay in receiving. When we, when we initially acknowledge um, a, a receipt of a complaint or an inquiry, do we, do we set out in, in, in the reply the timescales that they are likely to be expecting to get responses back to sort of, so at least they know of some expectation of when they can expect a second letter or a, a judgment. And then also on that, do your staff, do the staff have the ability um, to make decisions without at first point of contact without having to necessarily refer that to someone senior? Do they have that sort of autonomy to be able to do that? And then finally, what sort of training is in, ongoing training is in place? And when I say training, I also link to that health and well-being of these people that are at the sharp end of, of, of these sort of complaints. What sort of aftercare do we put in place for, for our, the people that we, that we, look, we work, work for us? Thank you. So when a complaint come in, it comes in, it's risk assessed and defined. So if it's something that's going in our process, we define that. That goes out as an acknowledgement or part of an, an acknowledgement to the complainant to say, these are the complaints we've defined, which could be out of a 12 page letter or email, and these will be responded to within 10 to 20 working days, which is the statutory time scale. I need to say within these regulations, there, is, there are no time scales, but I feel it's important for the council that we have time scales, not only to ensure that the complainant knows when that response is coming in, but it's really helpful for my team because they have teeth then going out to the service areas to say, I want a response within this, that, the other. Within the regs, we can also say, we can go back to them to say, we're not on track with this one. Can we have your permission to extend? And um, nine times out of 10, if we're told, we do go back and say that. If the complainant says no, that puts us in a bit of a tricky situation. And usually I have to get involved in respect of pulling things together. So yes, they are told of a timescale to respond. Now, if a complaint comes in, go, moving on to the ability to make a decision, if it's a straightforward issue, yes, or it will be referred to me. If it's something in respect of writing off, um, I don't know if you're aware, so for example, we'd have, we charge a 400 pound admin fee to set up someone's care that's self-funding. Um, so, for example, if they've only used that care for one day, you do have representation from people saying, you've set me up this care, but um, we take that to a meeting called the Financial and Commissioning Team Meeting, and we meet once a month with the budget holder because that affects their budget. So, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. Training, I've just done training for our colleagues in adult social care. Um, it's really important that not only that people are trained in relation to how to respond to a complaint and not provide a negative response. There are ways of talking to people, aren't there? There are ways of actually reflecting what you're actually saying and doing. Um, so we do do that. We do a QA session. When a complaint response has been done, it comes back into the team and we do a quality assurance check. You know, as it covered all the angles, is it as positive as it could be? Complaints can't be seen as a negative. They've got to be seen as a positive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we also do, we also work with our colleagues in health and safety to ensure that the people that are subject to the complaint, it's hard out there, it's hard being frontline, actually get some support in respect of supervision within their supervision to ensure they have that opportunity to say, I'm really concerned, I've got this complaint against me, 
we have to get over to them. It's not a disciplinary issue. If it was a disciplinary issue, when it came in to be um, looked at, you know, when we would actually review, is it a complaint? It wouldn't move forward within the complaints procedure. It would go by the safeguarding route or the HR route. And it's very important that people who are being investigated understand that. It's us asking questions to ensure we can respond to a complaint to see if there are any issues in respect of practice and lessons learned. And no adult social care are moving forward again in respect of practice. Um, jo Couter is a big advocate for restorative practice, how we, how we, how we work, how we need to uh, ensure that we learn lessons from everything that comes in. We don't want a postcode lottery, for example. We don't want things happening different in the north than are in the south of the county. We're a big county, so therefore, working together is that big thing. Thank you. Councillor McMahon. <coughs> First, I'm really keen on the restorative practice, but I think it's a great idea. It's certainly in medicine, I've seen, I've seen several people have complaints against them ultimately not upheld, but it's had a huge impact on, the, on, 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 their, <clears throat> on their confidence to practice and on their careers. Uh, and um, uh, so I think that the mutual that mutual support um, is, is great. <clears throat> um, it, Julia outlined quite clearly the, the delay, the communication and the money. Uh, and um, it's, it's just the money aspect I, I want to concentrate on for the moment. Because if I recall, there was a task and finish group set up about 18 months ago to look at the money and to look at the way that the, 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 the time scales between starting care and then going on to discuss the money were shortened considerably um, <coughs> in, in order for people to... Um, uh, recipients of care to understand their financial position and th it was felt that that delay as you've both outlined really um, has a, an impact on expectation <coughs> um, and, and I, I just wonder where we are with that because that 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 could that could solve a lot of problems um, because it's it, the complaint comes from an unrealistic expectation because of the delay not because of the fact that we're going through the right processes in terms of assessing their their financial position. Um, so over to you. Thank you. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right there. And that also relates to the process we've got of sending out invoices and getting those debts paid. And unless it's done in a timely manner, it becomes very difficult. Um, and actually, our debt levels do need to come down. Um, I've discussed this with Ian Parry because, um, you know, s the financial assessments and the invoicing, etc., is done by a finance team within the finance directorate. So it's a split responsibility. Um, and I'm in discussions with Ian Parry, who's the cabinet le lead, to actually look at the processes to make sure that we are far more efficient and effective. Um, in not only communications but the time scales because it does impact on service delivery it impacts on complaints and it will impact even more significantly if we don't have a far better system uh, when the changes to the social care act come because one of the things that we will be doing uh, as part of that change in the legislation is paying care providers the gross amount and then claiming it back uh, if, if the assessment says that the individual has to pay uh, their contribution, whereas at the moment they, they pay some of it themselves to the care provider and then we pay the other, or the NHS. So um, we do need to get on top of that. We need to make sure that we have uh, a very efficient, easy to understand process, because I think we will be encountering some real difficulties mm -hmm. Um, so I am in discussions with Ian Parry. We are already um, tasking, and I've spoken to Richard Harling about it, how we can do things differently. And I want to see that happen within the next three months uh, because it is important. I'm sure Kate will be delighted to hear. 
I, I think the expectations aren't helped because a lot of people don't see the difference between health and care. They don't see the difference between the NHS and being looked after at home. And clearly the NHS is free at the point of use. That's, that's the big mantra about it. And, and secondly, a lot of um, countries in the United Kingdom, social care is free. And I think both those things don't help the whole, the whole business of, of perception and that plus any delay doesn't help. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful, thank you. I think that's, that's really encouraging to hear that, isn't it? That we, you know, and, and especially uh, the point you make about the new legislation when that arrives. Um, now, our, an excellent report, unless there's any other questions. Uh, uh, again, Kate, thank you. Uh, and Councillor Jessel, thank you also for uh, coming this morning. Uh, I, really encouraging, you know, to see that we manage what is a difficult area of business really well. So thank you again. Item seven and the, the work program. Is it in? Yep, that's right. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, I'll be as brief as I can because I think we're warming up nicely, we aren't are. we? Uh, so the next meeting's on the 1st of September. Uh, we've got um, the McAllister report is finally um, coming to that meeting. We've been waiting for that for a while, haven't we? Um, part of that was because it uh, we were waiting for the final publication, which came in May. Um, I've been discussing this with um, officers who are writing the report. There's, there's still a bit of a question mark about it because obviously it, it depends on, the report is there and it's finally published, but it depends on what the government choose to accept from it as to you know, what the council will do with it, if you see what I mean. But, uh, but um, I've, I've asked because we've been waiting for it for a while, to, for it to come anyway on the basis that we're, n we're clearly not going to be able to give definitives about what it, it is the, the implication for, for the council until we hear more from the government. We've then also got the update on children's services transformation, and we've also got one item for uh, pre-decision scrutiny, which is on the family hub model, which they referred to today as well. Um, then, um, Chair, it's a, a query to, to the members as to um, whether or not we want to add an extra item onto there. Uh, you attend the Children's Improvement Board on behalf of the, the committee, and um, following the Ofsted-focused visit and, and the uh, letter that they wrote, and w which was at the end of May, you asked for the Improvement Action Plan to come to the committee at some point that will be available. It's just whether you want to include that on the 1st of September or whether you want to include it on a... Uh, we ha is the relatively busy one in September? September is relatively busy. The next one we've got, we've put an extra meeting in in October, but that is very much looking at um, sort of community safety. It doesn't mean it can't go on there, but the th the th the th there we're looking at the... Um, uh, we've got the outcome of the Fishmongers Hall and we've also got the, the LA's role as part of the Prevent Partnership. Yeah. So it, 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 but it can go there if needs be. No, I'm happy for it to go on the September. September, now. okay. Um, I, I've only had a, a, a brief understanding of what the letter said, but I think it's all quite positive. Yep. So uh, I don't think, unless it generates a lot of questions, I don't think it will be a big talking point. Okay, lovely. Uh, so I'll include that on the 1st of September then. Um, at the last meeting, we discussed the fact that the Send White Paper, which has been on your work programme for some time, went to Prosperous, and I, I forwarded that report to you with the extract from the Prosperous Minute. So it's just whether or not you want that to, to remain as an item to come here or whether you feel it's been dealt with by Prosperous and it will be a duplication. So it's whether or not it remains on. Well, I don't know what other members uh, felt of it, but when I read it, it I, I, I think I'm just conscious that if it's going to come here, we need some clear safeguarding reason why it, it comes here. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me to be simply a service, how we're going to deliver a service, and it, it felt better with Prosperous. I mean, I'm going to die in a ditch over it if people want, want to see it here. But um, I, 
you know, a, a little like the complaints thing. I know that we have to have them, but sometimes I fail to see where the safeguarding issue is. And time is of the essence anyway. So um, I just thought that maybe it was best left with Prosper. John? Um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. I, I, I think the decision needs to be made before it goes to Prosper's about, because we have had joint committees in the past um, where both, where two school committees have gone together, met, met in the chamber <coughs> and deliberated an issue and, and challenged <coughs> on an issue. And that's worked quite well. And, and, I, and I think that, that that's a better way of doing it than taking up officer time and getting them come to two scrutiny committees and, <coughs> and not sharing ideas with folk from another scrutiny committee on a particular issue. So as a matter of principle, I think it's better done that way than, than, than the officers trooping from one scrutiny committee to another. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that off for now and then we'll, we'll follow it through and, and, and discuss whether or not we need some sort of joint meeting as, as it works its way through. In the future, it's far better making a decision earlier on rather than now. Okay, yeah, <coughs> absolutely. Uh, then uh, we're still waiting for the exact response on the sexual harassment in schools report, but I've had a word with Mr Sutton this morning and that's, that's on its way. And then the only other thing to say, uh, Chair, I don't know if you want to take this, is just on young carers, and that we'll be looking at that again in from September, won't we? Yeah, I think members will be aware that we had a plan uh, for members to go out and visit. Um, we've had some feedback from the, uh, the provider, uh, and in fact, I'm meeting with her at half past two, I think it is, this afternoon. And uh, they make a reasonable, a very reasonable point that these young people have a limited amount of time in respite, these clubs that they go to, and being faced with um, members asking them questions uh, seriously eats into, it, into that. And it's, it's their time to relax and reflect and do. So I think it would be silly of us to disagree with that. Um, so what we're gonna discuss at half two, and I'll bring it back to the committee, is to hear what the provider, they're still keen that we understand the views of young people and young carers, but I think they're going to suggest a different way of achieving that. Um, I'm very grateful that Helen's done some work on what that might look like. Um, and so hopefully following half two's meeting, I'll be in a position to say where, where we are with that. But in the meantime, we've canceled the, you know, the, uh, the member visits. I think it, it's it's right and proper that it is their time and we're encroaching on it. Yeah. To celebrate or, or, or to thank them for the work they do, maybe collectively having them all together as opposed to individually, that we can just celebrate what they've done. You know, something put on by us as a, you know, the county or whatever. I mean, I don't... I understand the bit about, you know, us all turning up at where they're having their respite. I get all that, you know. Um, but maybe in some way to recognise the, the sterling work they do, we could put something on. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know what the format would be, but some sort of... I, th I, I think what we'll do is... I'll raise that with them at half past yeah. two, just to see. I think we've, we have to be guided by them. Uh, they're the experts. They're the people who are providing the service to vulner a vulnerable group of people. And I don't think we can be prescriptive I think we have an objective in as much as we want to make sure that we're supporting them enough. Mm. But I think we have to be very much guided by them as to how we achieve that. Feedback from? No, I, I, all the provider has asked us to cancel all of the visits. Yeah. yeah. So we've done that. Um, so there are no visits anymore now. And if we'd already had one or two? No, we've had one. One? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, and again, I think part of the reason came from that. Mm -hmm. it, it does encroach into valuable time. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I, there's nothing to exclude. Well, there's no public here, is there? But there's nothing else, is there? No? No? That's great. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the warm weather.